sense of a, a kind of letting the vehicle fall over and stay in line with the velocity down. So there's this kind of interesting thing called a gravity turn where you, uh, where it's, it seems like you're just letting gravity have the thing fall over, but in practice that isn't quite the case. Um, the, in practice, the, the rocket is not a, an aerodynamically steerable vehicle. And in particular, it's something that a, a big full-on launch vehicle is something that if you ever get to an angle of attack of more than a degree or something, you're you're in danger of, of having the thing start to tumble, and then you're in, in serious business trouble. And so, in fact, the uh, when we steer the vehicle, basically we start we kick it over in the direction we want it to go, and then after that, all we're doing is steering to to keep it in the um, keep it in line with its velocity vector. Because the last thing you want is the velocity vector being one thing and the direction the vehicle is pointed being radically different because that's a recipe for the thing to, uh, to tumble. So anyway, we'll do that a little later. But right now we're just going to do vertical work. So, so here's the assumption. If, uh, if we just do vertical launch from the ground, we'll assume constant gravity. So uh, that would be appropriate for like the first stage where it doesn't go that high. Because of course, if, it's, if you're getting up to orbital altitudes, then say you're up a couple hundred kilometers, gravity's actually dropped by a few percent. So it may not be, it's not an overarching effect, but it's certainly the variation of gravity is something without to is, is something you have to, to, to take into account. And in particular, at well, here's the calculation for 100 kilometers. The gravity is down by, by 3%. And because the scales is one over the radius, and so at sea level, it's uh, we have R naught, and then up 100 kilometers, you have 6378 plus 100. So if you take this, this ratio and square it, you get 0.97 of sea level gravity. So uh, if, you, if you find that your, that your uh, apogee altitude is, is uh, you know, a order 100 kilometers or higher, well, your answer's off by a few seconds. I mean, a few percent at least. Uh, so right for the moment, we're going to assume, we're going to just ignore atmospheric gravity. And that turns out to be not that bad an assumption for a big launch vehicle. It's an awful assumption for like a rocket lab vehicle, which is much smaller, and the ratio of surface area to volume is much larger than it is for a, for a full-on multi-stage launch vehicle. So the ground the, the drag penalty for like a Titan III is of order of percent. The, the drag penalty for the for Traveler is of order 250 percent or something. It's, it's just not a negligible at all. So, uh, now, there's another thing that for the moment we're going to neglect, although it's not that hard to put in. Drag's not that hard to put in, too. Well, actually, none of these are, are hard to put in in your regular fluid. Um, you remember I said that thing about optimal nozzles? Basically, the, we have the pressure term in the thrust equation, which means thrust actually goes up with altitude. And so, uh, and that variation is incorporated in the equivalent exhaust velocity. So, realistically, we should be changing the equivalent exhaust velocity with altitude. And, but for the moment, I'm going to just ignore that. Okay, so, so here's our differential equation. We have, first of all, the, the rate of change of velocity is the acceleration terms. And there's two of them. There would also be air drag, but we're ignoring that. There's, first of all, there's gravity, and I'm just giving that as a constant because we're seeing constant gravity. And then second of all is this thrust term. So, uh, and this is, uh, one over MV, MVT times the equivalent exhaust velocity. This is, of course, the term that we integrated to get the rocket equation. And in fact, if we just took away the gravity term, then if you integrated this, then you would just get the rocket equation, except now we have this gravity thing in here as well. So, so as a function of time, our mass is decreasing. If we assume constant mass flow, then it's just a linear interpolation between, uh, between the initial mass and the burnout mass. And by the way, I don't know, um, you guys are not necessarily that fluent with linear interpolation, but uh, a thing like this, you can sort of glance at it to see what the limits are. Because if, uh, if the time is equal to zero, then this whole second term goes away and we just have the initial mass in zero. But if we put in the burnout time, T sub B, then T over T sub B is equal to one, and so this whole thing is just, it, you, we have this one time, so M naught minus M naught plus M sub B. So this is a linear interpolation from, um, uh, this is T, and we have M naught and M burnout, and T sub B. So, so, <coughs> so that's 
we are, that's what that gives. So now, if you uh, if you integrate this, well then the um, that you remember that when we integrated to find the log the uh, uh, to get the rocket equation, then we effectively integrated this. Here we're doing the same thing except we're keeping the time dependence. In other words, we're we're using the intermediate values and we're also doing the have, we have the gravity term here, and we allow for the possibility that there's some initial velocity when we, when we fire the thing off. So for example, if it's the second stage, then our initial conditions are when the second stage starts to fire. So we're gonna have some initial velocity at the beginning of that. So gravity times time, well that's just the, uh, that's the, the uh, accumulation of gravity during the burn, and, and then this is, the, this is the log that you get, because one over m gm dt, is the, is the time derivative of, of log m. We, we did that before, we did that in the rocket So that's where that thing comes from. And so our delta v for a whole burn, well, that's just the rocket equation, except it includes the gravity penalty. <clears throat> so by the way, one implication of this is, you know, the, the plain old rocket <coughs> equation doesn't have any gravity in it, so it doesn't matter how slow or how quickly you burn your fuel. And in fact, in space, it really doesn't matter. So that's why you can use things like ion engines, which have just a tiny trickle of fuel. The fuel's moving very rapidly, but, but the mass flow is very tiny. And that's okay, you get your delta V. You may get it over months, but you get it. In a gravity field, it's not like that. If you have high thrust, then your burn is over very quickly and your gravity penalty can be very small. Because gravity times burn time is your penalty. In the limit that your thrust is, is very, very quick, then, then your burn is kind of instantaneous. It's, the, it's as if somebody hit you, hit it with a sledgehammer from underneath, in which case the gravity penalty is negligible. That would be, that's actually the limit corresponding to an, an, uh, an instantaneous maneuver, like when we do a delta V in space and we consider it instantaneous. So the limit of, of high thrust, short burn time, is in fact an instantaneous maneuver. So it's like the, the, the velocity changes it doesn't even take any, any, uh, any time or any distance. Uh, now, that's not realistic. Even a small, uh, well, uh, a kid's rocket, an ST's rocket is maybe a quarter second or something, but, but the bigger ones you know, are gonna be are 10, 15 seconds at least, and then the, the very big ones, the, uh, the first stage is, is gonna fire for at least like three, five minutes, something like that. So, okay, in, so we have this dependence now on bird time, and um, if you, the higher the thrust, the, the, uh, the higher the delta V. Now, if, uh, if you're on orbit, again, you, the other thing is you don't need a, uh, you don't need to exceed, um, you, your thrust doesn't need to exceed your weight. If you're standing up and you're trying to uh, launch from, from the ground, you don't get vertical acceleration unless your thrust is greater than your weight. And same thing is true, by the way, for an aircraft. If you have a small propeller aircraft like a Cessna, well, it can't really climb straight up. Its thrust to weight ratio is, I don't know the number, maybe 0 0.3 or something. If you get to a fighter aircraft, the thrust to weight may be more like 1.3 or something, so it can, in fact, accelerate straight up. And in a rocket, of course, it can accelerate straight up, although a fully fueled multi-stage rocket typically has a thrust to weight at liftoff that's fairly small, it's like 1.2 or something, which is why the initial acceleration is like 0.1 or 0.2 gravity, that's where that number comes from. You take the thrust away, subtract one, and that's your initial acceleration in gravity. Okay, so now let's figure out how high it's actually going during the burn, and so that's your initial altitude. If you're launching from sea level, then of course that's zero. It could still be, um, it could still be non-zero even if it's the first stage from the ground. I mean, you could be launching from the desert. It could be having, um, an altitude of you know 5,000 feet, three kilometers or something. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's 1.6 kilometers. Um, but we'll just take the simple assumption that the initial velocity and the initial altitude is zero. So we just have the, the integral of the of the velocity, time dependent velocity term. So so okay, we have our gravity that integrates over time, and then we have the integral of this of this a log of a linearly varying function. And now, if uh, uh, I'm old enough to have a thick table of integrals where 
I don't use them anymore, but I still have them. In fact, uh, the, the thick table of integrals is now a weight on my workbench. So a lot of old books are kind of like that. But nowadays, if you want to look up an integral, you either go look it up online or you type it in Mathematica or some kind of symbolic manipulator, and it will just tell you the integral, and in fact, evaluate it for you if you like. And so um, when I first wrote these notes, I got it out, of course, my garage trying to reach it, which is a, a thick book that I never look at anymore. So, so okay, anyway, the, uh, this is the, that thing on the right is the indefinite integral corresponding to this. And you, if you substitute that, that in, then you, then you get this, uh, uh, you get finally this analytic formula. By the way, the, uh, the GT term, that is easy to integrate. That just, it's a half GT squared. With the minus sign, because of course, the acceleration of gravity is down, the velocity, the change in velocity due to gravity is negative, and the change in height due to gravity is therefore also negative. And then, now the rest of the thing, we still have a, uh, we still have a burn time effect in here. And, uh, but the rest of it you see is just the, uh, the, it has the mass ratio. And that's a, uh, you can't just, uh, well, I, I don't have the mathematical intuition to just stare at this and see what it does. So, um, we can sort of take limits. If the, if the mass ratio gets big, well, first of all, if the mass ratio gets big, then, then the, um, then this is a fairly large function, although it in increases much less rapidly than, than one. If the mass ratio is big, then, then this goes to zero, this goes to minus one. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what? Okay, I remember what's going on. Yes, um, this doesn't actually get real big. In fact, the limit is that as the mass ratio gets big, the height during burn is, uh, is not necessarily that high. So, Now, if uh, the kind of vehicle that we're analyzing here is called a sounding rocket, and well, that's really more of a functional description than a description of, of what it, um, of, the, of the trajectory, because a sounding rocket basically is a rocket that goes straight up and straight down. And those are normally used for scientific purposes. Well, of course, in the early rocketry programs, they were used just, uh, they launched them straight up just to kind of see what they would do. But once rockets got to be sort of mature and were used for things, then beside the missiles, which is what they were used for in World War II. But after the war, when they were just, they were sending up rockets for scientific purposes to see what you could see from above the atmosphere. And there's a lot of stuff, by the way, that you have to be outside the atmosphere to see. X-rays, for example, are absorbed completely by the atmosphere. And uh, ultraviolet, shorter than, than like 300 nanometers, is, is absorbed also by the atmosphere. And uh, which a uh, good thing, too, or we would just get, we would get totally fried by solar UV, and you kind of fry it up even as it is by longer wavelength ultraviolet, but the shorter stuff is pretty damaging and is luckily filtered out by the ozone layer at, at, uh, at, at 50 kilometers at the top of the stratosphere. So, so okay, there's a lot of science you want to be able to do from, from above the atmosphere, and if you just go straight up and straight down, then <coughs> that means you don't hang around up there like you do in orbit. So. Uh, so you have maybe a few minutes of, of scientific payload time where you, you send a rocket up. Uh, if it goes up to, let's say it goes up to an apogee altitude of say three, four, 500 kilometers, then most of the seriously thick part of the atmosphere is over by 100 kilometers. So, so you get this kind of coast time, this ballistic time of, of some minutes while you're above 100 kilometers. And then if, you're, if your rocket is configured to open its payload, so your little telescope or whatever it is can point up and look, then then you have this. Uh, then you have this time that you can use. And if it has to, if it has to actually point in a particular direction, like if you want to look at the sun, and that, by the way, is an important use of sounding rockets. Then you have to be able to steer your rocket while you're above the atmosphere. So, and you have to go find the sun and point at it, and, and have your your, uh, your little solar telescope uh, look for whatever features you can see without the atmosphere in the way. So, so anyway, that's what sounding rockets are for. And the rocket lab vehicles. Well, they're basically sounding rockets too, except they don't really have payloads, except to tell where they are. And uh, in the best of circumstances, they only get barely above 100 kilometers. So they're not actually, at the moment, they're not that useful for a, a well, besides with a reliability of 0, 0.00, uh, they're, they're not that good at sounding rocket vehicles either. But that may change in the future. So we'll, we'll see about that. So um, now again, if you're going up and straight down, then you would tend to impact the Earth supersonically, which is not so good for returning equipment with recorded science.
scientific data on them. So, so there's some kind of recovery system, uh, typically a, a parachute of some kind. Now, if uh, so far with the integrals, we've only looked at what happens during the burn, and that's not the important part. The, the burn, of course, only it takes you up some distance, and, but the main thing is it gets you going fast, and after that, you just coast. So uh, you can you can just use conservation of energy to figure out how high you coast. So if uh, if you assume constant gravity, then that's a real easy thing to do. Uh, it is slightly more difficult, but it's only like one step more difficult. To, to use the, the real formula for gravity, but you can still use conservation for energy even if you don't assume constant gravity. But if you do assume that, then it's really simple. The change of potential energy as you go from burnout to apogee is just the burnout mass times gravity times the change in height, which is unknown here, but we can equate that to the kinetic energy you have at burnout, half times burnout mass times, times the velocity at burnout squared. And by the way, the, uh, of course, the burnout mass just cancels on both sides. The, that is no longer the case if we do air drag, both because, well, first of all, we can't, we can't just equate energy if we have air drag because it's no longer a conservative system. Air is slowing us down irreversibly with friction. So, but if it's just coasting without drag, then the energy we have at burnout, we keep that energy, it just changes into potential energy, and we can calculate the apogee also. Now, if, uh, so we can just solve for what the what the apogee altitude is. <coughs> now, um, as you can tell by looking at this, the the height the apogee altitude is is maximized by by minimizing the burn time, and um, and the way you can tell that is by noticing <coughs> the um, the limit of this thing is um, uh, this turned out to be a negative number. So the Minimizing the burn time is, is a good thing to do for maximizing the altitude. However, if your burn time, if you just change nothing but the burn time and make it shorter, then your acceleration goes up. And having a really high acceleration, even if it's only for a few seconds, can, can, uh, is pretty bad for your payload and every electronic thing that you want to have on the vehicle. So, and not only that, the other vehicle itself may be in danger if the burnout speed is too high. And in fact, one of the things that the Rocket Lab has been working on for the last half a year or a year is, is increasing the burn time of their solids by adding stuff to make it burn slower in order that the, the burn can just can take longer, decreasing speed under under thrust and make it and also make it so the peak speeds occur at higher altitudes so the air drag is less. So, so there's a bunch of kind of mission stuff going on. Right now we're just doing the most basic kind of math. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a 10,000 kilogram, this is a big sounding rocket, and we have a mass ratio of five, in other words, it's 80% propellant. And if we assume a specific impulse of 300 seconds, and by the way, remember from the, the discussion I had of kind of typical numbers, typical solid propellants, the ISP is more somewhere in the 200s, typically low 200s. And so if, it's, if the ISP is 300, it's probably some kind of a liquid rocket engine. It's not the highest performance liquid rocket. Those are above 400 seconds, but it, it's just some kind of middling performance. It might be um, might be kerosene and, and LOX, for example. So if we assume, and these are just kind of numbers I pulled out, if we assume a mass flow of 40 kilograms per second, and just to have round numbers, I'm assuming gravity is 10. It's really you know, 9.8 or something meters per second squared. And we're taking that as a constant. So, so what's our thrust? Uh, mass flow times equivalent exhaust velocity, 1.2, well, um, 120 kilonewtons or 0.12 meganewtons. And by the way, you, if you go out on the web and look for big rocket engines, it's not exactly that you can order them from the catalog, but they have part numbers and you can go and browse their specifications. Uh, this being America and we having not done the thing Carter wanted to do and convert us to the metric system, it, mostly they're quoted in pounds or megapounds. And <coughs> so, um, now, Pounds and newtons are numerically not that different uh, in, in order of magnitude. I mean, 2.2 uh, pounds corresponds to uh, to the uh, the force that you have holding up a kilogram, which is 9.8 newtons. So they're different by a factor of roughly four. If I if I did that right from my freshman physics or high school physics. So uh, megapounds, meganewtons is is 
the same order of magnitude but different by a factor of about four. And by the way, there was this thing that happened at NASA, and this was in the in the mid nineties. There was some some guy, this of course well after President Carter was out of office. And, and by the way, I've told you guys before that intellect doesn't really do everything. Carter was actually one of our smarter presidents, but he was also one of our more ineffective presidents. Okay. So but nevertheless, after, well after he was out of office, there was this thing that happened at NASA headquarters when they decided that all the NASA centers, JPL, Goddard, everybody, was going to convert fully to metric. And so they thought, so somebody said, well, okay, let's figure out how much this is going to cost. And they sent down an edict to all the centers and said, please do a cost estimation for what it will take to convert to metric. So they went, so at JPL, I know about this because I knew a bunch of guys at JPL at the time, and and the ED came down, all the labs in JPL, everything filtered down. And the guy that I knew just at the electric propulsion lab, which is sort of about, about the size, well, it's actually, at that time, it was about twice the size of this room and high bay and big tanks and stuff. They did ion engines and arc tests and stuff. So just in that lab, they they looked at all the uh, all the optical tables that they had, which were, of course, threaded in, in inch threads. They looked at their machines, which were all calibrated in, in, uh, in thousands of mills and lathes and everything, and, and all the stuff that they had, all their tools, and and their cost alone was was uh, was like six hundred thousand dollars to refit, and and then they they did the whole thing for JPL, and JPL's cost was I don't know forty six or something million dollars if I remember right, and then all the NASA centers came in with numbers like this, and so the total cost for going metric, the physical cost in buying new equipment, uh, turned out. It, it might have been in excess of a billion, and the idea just died. That was the end of it. Not a peep. But, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> I like to use metric stuff in class just because um, I, I like it as a self-consistent thing, and all my, all my code and all my notes and all my books and everything all use, all use metric stuff, and that's the way I was taught, so you know, inertia and everything. But the, the U.S. industry is still heavily English, so whether you like it or not, you, you kind of have to get used to, to uh, pounds and slugs and stuff. Good question. Yes? So NASA today, do they still use pounds and inches? Um, NASA internally in their documents, their design documents will tend to use SI units. The, there's usually a kind of a handoff to the real contractors. Of course, the real contractors convert over to, uh, to English units because that's the way they tend to work. And, and there's this famous thing uh, a few years ago where they they lost an entry on, they lost a vehicle on entry to Mars because of a handoff to, they, they had, uh, they subcontracted a propulsion system from a, a German buyer, uh, from a German producer rather, and there was nothing wrong with the, with the rocket system that the German guys produced, but however they gave thrust numbers which were interpreted as being in pounds, of course they weren't, and so the whole maneuver was miscalibrated and, and they, they lost the thing completely. And that's, Millions of dollars lost um, just because of not keeping track of the units consistently. So um, this is this is a failure of a big organization, and lots of people work on this problem. No one's found a good solution. So there's various institutional ways of doing it. None of them are very good. So really, you just have to pay attention to, to the stuff you buy and, and look carefully at the documentation and convert the units appropriately, and don't make mistakes. So. By the way, when, uh, when I grade your papers, when I grade exams, usually I take off, you know, like a point or something, or two points. If you make an arithmetic error or do some kind of, you know, meters to kilometers or something, I don't, do, I don't hate you too badly. Although, in real life, <coughs> that's, that's not a realistic penalty. But if, you're, if you're a JPL in charge of a program and you make a mistake like this and nobody catches it, millions of, millions of dollars and, and loss of decades of work, and it, it's very, very bad. So. I should actually penalize you much worse, but whatever I don't. So, so okay, so let's look at these numbers here. We have uh, 120 mega newtons, and our acceleration is, um, if we take thrust over mass and subtract gravity, that works out to be two meters per second squared. So this has thrust to, this has thrust to weight of uh, about 1.2, and so in fact we can lift off because the acceleration is, is positive. And at the end of the burn, we, we, the mass goes down to burnout mass, which you remember is only 20% of the initial mass. 
And so at the end of the burn, we're basically at, uh, at five graphics. So this is, this is one thing that's, that's uh, the problem with, you know, that I've mentioned this before, the, the notion of single stage to orbit comes up every 20 years or so in, in, in NASA. And uh, the, the way to avoid all the penalties of staging and everything will be so beautiful once we have just everything simplified with single stage. But, but this, this penalty, this, the, uh, the, this, the double whammy of having the rocket equation uh, where the delta beam is only logarithmic with mass ratio, that kills you, plus the peak acceleration and burnout kills you. So uh, all that is overcome to some degree with staging, and which is one of the things we're gonna talk about. So okay, burnout, you're going at five gravities, and how long does this thing burn? Well, 40 kilograms per second, divide that into the total propellant mass, you get 200 seconds. So a little over three minutes. So, in fact, uh, the the numbers I picked, they are um, the actually the, the liftoff acceleration is, is sort of appropriate for a much larger vehicle. And in practice, a vehicle of this size, it could be um, it will have a much quicker burn. So, if we look at how fast we're going at burnout, we have our uh, uh, we have our rocket equation term minus the gravity penalty term. And if you look at these separately, you see that the, uh, the gravity penalty is about 40% of the, of the total. So our uh, lower is the total by about 40%. So you would have, without gravity, you would have gotten almost five kilometers per second, but with gravity, you get only about three kilometers per second, roughly speaking. So if you, uh, if you put in again, if, if you now look at the altitude that you get, you see that the, pardon, the, uh, the gravity penalty here, that is the gt squared over two, is about half of the term that you get just from, from uh, the uh, integrating during the burn. So without any gravity, this is how far you would have gone during the burn, but with gravity, you're, you're reduced by uh, uh, about 50%. So you're getting up to 160 <coughs> kilometers, and that's, that's during the burn, so of course, when the thing burns out, you're going pretty fast, and so you're going to coast actually quite high. And so if you if you do that, then we have this equation where we equated kinetic and potential or kinetic energy with change of potential energy from burnout, and so we get actually 560 kilometers, and for apogee altitude. And you see, we have a problem with this with the constant gravity assumption because at 560 we're down actually by 15% on, on gravity. So in fact, uh, under these assumptions, it would have actually coasted a little high, I mean, with, if we, uh, if we had, had used realistic gravity. Now, for a vehicle of this size, there's still a, there's still a preachable drag penalty. So in fact, these numbers come down quite a bit with drag. So now, here's what, here's what gravity looks, I'm sorry, here's what air drag looks like, and, and, uh, and you arrow guys who are in the majority here have uh, uh, certainly seen this. So, we have, a, we have a dimensionless coefficient, which is the drag coefficient. <coughs> we have the frontal area, the case of F. So in other words, if you, have, if you look at a rocket sideways, it's a long skinny thing, but if you look at it from the front, it's just basically a circle with some, some lines for fins. And, that's, and that, that's the area that we're looking at, actually, the frontal area. And the um, rho is the atmospheric density, and of course that changes with altitude, V is the vehicle speed. And you notice that that one of the things in here is the, um, we can collapse one of the terms here and make this thing piece of D, which, we, which is the dynamic pressure, a half rho D squared. And one way you can think of this is the, is the amount of momentum that's coming at you per square meter, and then how fast you encounter the momentum is also, and that's linear with velocity, and then how fast you encounter that momentum is also proportional to velocity. So it's, so your dynamic pressure actually goes as, as velocity squared. So, uh, so you have your, and, and this has of course the units of pressure. So now, pressure is, is force per unit area, and we're multiplying by frontal area, so the units of this whole expression are in fact just force. Now, the, this thing turns out to be a reasonable expression to use for rockets, but you have to know that for a rocket, you go from from zero speed up to a pretty good Mach number, and the drag coefficient is not actually constant. So you can't just pick a number and, 
call that your drag coefficient as you would for an aircraft, because for an aircraft, you are usually worried about lift to drag at your operating conditions. So in Jet Airline, for example, it's going to spend 95% of its service life at you know 620 knots or whatever the uh, uh, whatever the speed is for 737. Um, and so the you don't care that much about what the drag coefficient is at other times. What well, you do for takeoff and landing, obviously, because it has to you have to survive those things and not burn up a bunch of your fuel during those times. But but the, the, the operating distance, which is of course what you care about for an economic calculation, comes mainly from drag coefficients at your operating speed. So you can if you get that very accurate, you're mostly in good shape for an airline. Not so for a rocket, because the rocket is is kind of never at constant speed. It, it's always Okay, so in fact, uh, I think actually I stuck some curves in here later on. I may run them in the presentation. But in fact, what the, the drag coefficient is sort of a, a constant for low Mach numbers, well subsonic, and then it goes up and up and has a kind of a peak through transonic, through Mach 1, and then it goes down again to the supersonic plane. Because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of uh, weirdo crap that happens as you go through Mach 1, as you, as you learn part of it, as you, as you watch the rain go. We don't learn analytically, but. <laughs> Okay, so if uh, <coughs> I think we, we kind of had this before, or we had some pieces of it, but um, this is this is a very simple formula. It's just a, a it's not a very good curve fit, but it's an okay <coughs> but not great curve fit to the to atmospheric density with altitude. It's it's much better actually to use the the standard altitude formulas. And if you ever have to do calculations where the where the Density with altitude has to be pretty exact. Then, then you should just go and download the source code for um, for the standard atmospheric models. And the, most of them are kind of old, so it's it's good if you have a poor kind of compiler. Some of them may have been ported to MATLAB. I'm not sure. I have a I actually recently went through this. I had some reason to do this, but um, but just for the purposes of, of these simple assignments that we're doing here, or simple calculations, this actually works pretty well. So. The, the basic thing is that you can actually just from basic physics, uh, thermodynamics and so on, you can you can do the calculation that says that, that the the density and pressure in, as a function of altitude both fall off exponentially with altitude. And um, so the thing I've mentioned a couple of times is a rule of thumb. Uh, this is pretty good for doing back to the envelope kind of calculation. So whatever it is at sea level, the density you go up 10 miles and you're down by a factor of 10. You go up another 10 miles, you're down by another factor of 10. So 20 miles up, you're down by a factor of 100. So uh, 20 miles is 32 kilometers. So in 32 kilometers, we're down by a factor of 100. So uh, in if you go all the way to space, 100 kilometers, then roughly speaking, we're down six orders of magnitude in in density. So uh, even if you're Reinhold Messner, you can't you can't breathe. If, if Everest were up 100 kilometers. Even he would have to carry on oxygen. So, okay. So, oh, by the way, let me just mention before I go to the next thing. We, I kind of got ahead of myself two or three lectures ago when we did the numerical methods thing because I kind of showed you this math before, uh, very quickly and roughly, just because I, I used it in the in the couple of versions of the MATLAB code that I showed you. And you remember there was a simple one which just used a finite time step to approximate the equation of motion. And then there was the, the one that used the kind of built-in MATLAB thing for integrating with a variable time step at much higher accuracy. We will come back to that. We're going to have problems on the homework that are going to use the approaches that I gave in, in, in that class two or three, whatever it was, five years ago. Okay, now, now I want to talk about what happens when you go to orbit. And uh, the Whereas the sounding rocket and the rocket led vehicles go straight up and straight down again, uh, ignoring sideways and you know not quite vertical launch. See, uh, if you want to go to orbit, then you start out vertical. You wouldn't if there were no atmosphere. If there were no atmosphere, we would have totally horizontal launches because there would be no need to get through the thick part of the atmosphere. But since we do have a comparably thick atmosphere, the we. Uh, 
we go vertically in order to get through the atmosphere as quickly as we can, and then, um, and then having done so, the um, we get up some altitude and then we kind of kick the vehicle over. And typically, this is toward the east. If we're on the east coast and we're going to do a, a, a launch to a direct orbit, which you remember is, is generally speaking west to east. We might be a little north of east, a little south of east, but roughly speaking, we're going to go eastward if we're on the east coast. If we're going to Vandenberg, um, if we're going out of Vandenberg on the west coast, then the launches are generally southerly. And so that is the place where the, uh, where the military tends to do their, their polar orbits for reconnaissance missions. And because you can't launch polar orbits out of Canaveral, because in order to do that, you would, you're not in a safe launch zone. You have to launch out of the water. And of course, the water is, is a direct <coughs> east or a little north of east out of, out of uh, Canaveral. Whereas the coastline in Santa Barbara is not quite north-south. It's actually sort of facing south a little bit. And, and so the prevailing launches are to the west and to the south. And in fact, the, the coastline slants far enough that it's a safe launch if you want to go to the south. And that's how you get the polar orbit out of Canaveral. Also, that's where they do the, uh, the uh, anti-ballistic missile testing, you know, the Star Wars testing. Usually what they do is they have uh, uh, they send up uh, target missiles out of Vandenberg, and then they send up killer missiles out of Kwajalein Atoll in the South Pacific, in the Marshall Islands, and uh, and they see if the uh, if the kill vehicle can hit the, the target vehicle. And uh, the the typical way that this goes is they'll they'll have a mission and it will miss and it will fail, and then there'll be an article in the paper that says, uh, well, actually, it we consider it a success for the following reason, and therefore the whole program is a success for the again for the following. Small bubbles. This stuff doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's really cool to watch launches out of Vandenberg, though, because you can see them a long way away. You can see the trails from the launches, and because of the because of the different winds and wind shear at different altitudes, you see these trails that go in these beautiful patterns. They're really great, and you can see them all the way from Los Angeles sometimes. If, if the weather goes. Okay, so. Um, Five hours. Yeah. Yes. I'll stop. So we were talking about like the gravity penalty um, earlier. At what altitude is it no longer safe to assume that gravity's 9.8 meters per second squared? At what altitude do we need to start worrying about how that changes? Well, it depends on the accuracy you want. If, if, uh, if, if you just want very quick back of the envelope calculations, and then uh, and you're only going up by one or two hundred kilometers from, from Earth, then you're going to be going <coughs> off by a few percent. <coughs> Remember the thing I showed, at, at, uh, at, at 100 kilometers, we're down by 3% on gravity. At, at 560 kilometers, we're down by 15% on gravity. So up then, up there, it's starting to be a significant effect. Um, now, in, in practically any altitude, if you want very precise measurements, and very precise results, then when you, you want to get it accurate to two, three significant figures, then you have to use variable altitude gravity. So, now, it's not actually difficult. Instead of using gravity times height, you just for a change in potential energy, you just do the difference in, you know, <coughs> U over R1 minus mu over R2. That's all you have to do. So you might as well always heck you're do it on the computer anyway. You might as well just use the real function. So, um, okay, so so here's kind of how things look. The, we're gonna do a uh, we're gonna do a lift off straight up and then at some altitude we're gonna do a we're gonna steer the vehicle and the vehicle doesn't have any aerodynamic steering, typically, so what you have to do is actually deflect the exhaust in some way, either by turning the whole entire engine, which is one way of doing it, or by deflecting the exhaust by having something in the exhaust that deflects it, which was actually the original method during World War II. And then, once you're able to do that, then, um, then you initiate this turn and the vehicle follows the turn, and if everything goes right, and I'll show you the differential equations that kind of govern all that, and um, and past the initial part of past the initial program turn that, that gets you uh, at an angle to vert a specified angle to vertical, past that point there's sort of <coughs> no more degrees of freedom uh, in your in your differential equations if you want to keep zero angle of attack. Um, and I'll show you why that is and how it all works. Um, and so that's the so-called gravity turn phase. And by the way, there could be stage events happening in here. The the first stage finishes burning possibly here, possibly here, possibly up there. The second stage goes on to the third stage. And so
So usually your third stages, your, your three stages at the big stage vehicle happen all the way at burnout, and by burnout, you're going horizontally. And if everything is calculated properly, uh, now you are at an altitude and speed moving horizontally so that you have a home and transfer to take you up to your parking lot. Now, this is sort of a switch from what we've been talking about because always, up till now when we talk about orbital maneuvers, we always assume we're in a parking orbit and we use a home and transfer to leave it. Now, we're actually gonna use a home and transfer to get there and that's what's actually, that's what's actually done. So, um, so the picture uh, it is, is kind of like this. If, uh, here's the Earth and here's the circular orbit. The, this is our actual parking orbit that we're, that we're aiming for. So our launch, this picture here looks like this. So I'm drawing, of course, the scale is too big. But now, after this point, after burnout, we are, this is now home and transfer. So this is perigee right here. And this is apogee. And, and the transfer, this is now ballistic, coasting, in other words. We're coming up like this. And now we're going to do another delta V here. So, so this is like the home and transfers that we've talked about so far, except that the second delta V is just a regular instantaneous delta V like we've been talking about to go from this coast up to the parking orbit, you know, another a instantaneous delta V in order to establish the parking orbit. And whereas the first delta V is basically the entire maneuver for launching from the ground. So you get up to this burnout point and the, you turn your engines <coughs> off and that altitude and that speed uh, you're now moving horizontally at a certain speed, and that is that is parity. So, this is what we have. Our initial, our initial everything is vertical, and then we initiate our gravity turn. That's the program turn, and then during during the gravity turn, we transition to horizontal flight, and that's the equation that I'll show you in a minute. And and then burnout. Well, that's not a that's just that's not a phase exactly. That's just a moment. And so burnout separates three from five. And then this is while we're coasting up to the parking orbit. And then finally, the, we have the speed up to circularize at the parking orbit. So just for example, if uh, one of the things that the, the uh, I occasionally have these, these daydreaming conversations with, uh, with the Rocket Lab guys about what it would mean if we were going to do an orbital launch sometime in the future. Traveler and DCX and all that stuff, the bug roll worked out, and they've done a bunch of successful, uh, you know, apogee high up above from carbon lines and all the space. Now, you can imagine that if you had uh, a whole bunch of travelers or DCXs, you could bundle together a whole bunch of them, and that would be a first stage. And you could imagine taking another one and having that be your second stage. That isn't enough to get to orbit, though. That might that might get you if you had a pretty good set of impulse and really light structure lighter than you can make now. Um, that might get you up to the up to the tangent of your of a parking orbit. But you would still need to carry along as part of your payload a, another engine, another smaller engine to speed up at the parking orbit. So minimally you have to have three stages. There's the first two stages to get you up to burnout where your speed to coast up at the parking orbit and then some third stage to uh, to circularize. So, so that can be your thinking for the future. So is it usually when the stage change at that burnout? Mm -hmm. Or is it when the burnout and then they drop that and then get the um, apogee or? The, that is often a, an engine that's strapped on the payload itself. Because the rocket vehicle, nobody cares if it gets into orbit. In fact, if it does get into orbit, then, then it stays around the space debris. So in fact, what you would, uh, the, the better thing to do is to, uh, is to have your, your rocket stuff just fall away and go back into the atmosphere. And then the, uh, and the, uh, but meanwhile you have the, the main onboard thruster of your payload, of your, of your spacecraft, that thing speeds up and circulates. And so now you're, in, uh, now you're in your parking orbit, and now sometime later, depending on what you have to do, you speed up, you do your plane change, all that stuff, and in order to get to your mission orbit. So, so yeah, that's right, the, uh, your, the launch vehicle typically will not put you in a circular Um, now, it may, if, uh, uh, if the, depends on how much you pay. This is all money. Okay, so, 
Okay, so this is the this is the picture that tells you it's it's the vector diagram that talks about what happens during gravity turn. So so far, this is a, a new kind of picture that we've drawn for rocket vehicle because so far everything has been assumed to be vertical, or else we're assumed to be in orbit. But this is this is actually a picture sometime during the atmospheric part of the flight, and we're at some angle with respect to vertical. So if this is the center of mass of the vehicle, then we have a downward force on the vehicle, which we can consider to be acting at the center of mass and straight down toward the center of the Earth. And then, um, and then meanwhile, we have our thrust acting along the axis of the rocket. And um, now, by assumption here, the thrust and the velocity vector are, and, and, the, and the axis of the vehicle itself are all in the same direction. Now, the thrust and the velocity, I'm sorry, the thrust and the vehicle axis, um, those kind of have to be aligned just from the, the design of the vehicle. If those two are not aligned, then you know, you know half of your mo nozzle's falling off or something. You know, like if, if, if this melted away, then you have a, you know, a weird component, sideways component of the thrust. But assuming, assuming your engine is aligned with your vehicle, then, then you just have to keep the vehicle aligned with the velocity vector. So you have to make minor adjustments to the, to the thrust vector, which is thrust beam balloon. We'll talk about that. Uh, but if you can keep the vehicle aligned with its velocity vector, then, then we follow this, uh, then we follow this, this force diagram. So the thing is going to, the thing is going to go in some kind of curved path, and any curved path instantaneously you can consider that it has some radius of curvature because you can take the acceleration that it has to the right and you can consider that acceleration to be a centripetal acceleration. And so um, anytime you have a centripetal acceleration, then you can, you can equate that to V squared over R and that tells you what your, where R is the of curvature. And you can say, okay, instantaneously I'm moving about to the center of curvature. Now, as you, uh, as you straighten out, your center of curvature is gonna get further and further away. It's not that you're just going in st steadily in a circle, you're not. You're going instantaneously in a circle, but as you go along, the center of curvature moves further and further away, and eventually you're going just flat and your center of curvature recedes to infinity, and you're going in a straight line. So, uh, so there's kind of several things going on, because first of all, you're going faster and faster, and this angle is changing too. So, uh, so at any given moment, if you're gonna, if you're, when you need to write the equation of motion, they have in them the, the, uh, the thrust, the mass of the vehicle, remember the mass is shrinking just like before, the angle from the vertical, which we can call theta, and, and the altitude, which will give us air drag and so on. And uh, as part of that, we need, of course, to calculate the, the radius of curvature, and it will tell us how, how fast we have to be turning. So, so our acceleration, and now this is the acceleration toward the right, not the acceleration straight forward, but the, um, this is the centripetal or sideways acceleration. So you remember I said we had mg acting straight down. Well, mg sine theta acts straight off to the right. And and we cancel the vehicle mass to give us the acceleration, so it's just g sine theta. We equate that to v squared over r, which you remember from high school physics, centripetal acceleration. And you can, you can separate the v squared over r, you can make that v times v over r, and you can call that uh, v over r, and you remember, um, is, is d theta dt if theta is given in radians. So, um, so this then is the, um, this is how fast the vehicle has to turn in order to keep up with the gravity turn. And um, so this is the basic equation for the gravity turn. And then um, everything else, we just have to integrate the vertical part of the acceleration to get the, the vertical change in speed and, and on the horizontal part. So. Um, if we're going to integrate these entire set of equations of motion, uh, and you can, uh, 
you can confidently expect that this will happen on your homework and uh, you know, I'll kind of build up a little bit, but it'll be next week or the week after you guys are gonna actually do this. Um, one of the pieces is gonna be the rate at which the rocket actually turns. Now, because the velocity is increasing, and it's increasing in, in a way that's not gonna be a very simple function of time. I mean, even, even with constant uh, air drag, I mean, constant gravity and no air drag, <coughs> the velocity is not going to be some simple function of time, particularly with it going in some curved path. But, but with variable gravity and with drag, there's, there's no chance that this, that, that this is going to be a thing you can just integrate in using calculus methods, you know, analytically. It's not going to happen. So this is going to be a system of equations which are going to be integrated numerically using the methods that I kind of presented a couple of lectures ago, whatever that was. Okay, so, so this is kind of a, this is sort of how things are going to go, I mean, just in words. We make this kind of gentle turn, and by the way, these are, the, the turn rates are very low. And uh, they're going to be in uh, much, <coughs> less, much less than, well, a order maybe a degree per second or, or less. They're, they're not going to be, they're not going to be big at all. And by the way, you, uh, you aero guys, you should be used to the idea that, that vehicles, that flying vehicles, when they're moving fast, they don't turn very fast either. So if, uh, if you're in a modern jet fighter aircraft, the, the time when you turn really fast is, is when you're going subsonic and you're, and you're dogfighting or whatever. But if you're going Mach 2 or Mach 2 and a half, your turn rates are very gentle. And you can, you can still get pretty good accelerations by turning, but, the, but in degrees per second, they're pretty slow. So basically, you don't, you don't try to dogfight it at, at high Mach numbers. Now, similarly here, um, we're, we're gonna be turning pretty slowly because this whole thing is gonna take many minutes. And the, the key thing about the vehicle control system, you don't have to actually steer to follow the gravity turn. The, the, uh, the, the control system doesn't have to know about the gravity turn. All the control system has to know is, is what, all it has to know is the difference between the velocity vector and the, uh, and the attitude of the vehicle. And if those two are not the same, that means you have a non-zero angle of attack. Remember what angle of attack is. Angle of attack is the, is the difference between the, the vehicle axis and the velocity vector. And, and this, is, this is actually a 2D number because if, uh, for a rocket, the angle of attack could occur upwards, downwards, sideways, you know, anywhere in a 2D, um, anywhere on a plane. So basically you need 2D control and the control loop has to be able to, to negate any non-zero <coughs> angle of attack. So, so basically the general idea is if you're flying in this direction but the angle of attack is like this, then you need to steer, you need to direct your thrust kind of down in order to go back toward, toward the velocity vector. And if you're, if you're sideways, of course, you've got to steer, if you're angled to the right, you've got to steer to the left. So wherever you are away from your velocity vector, you've got to steer back toward that. So all the, the, the whole uh, vector diagram that I just drew assumed that there was this control loop that was keeping the vehicle in the direction of its angle of attack. So they use this term gravity turn to indicate that sort of the vehicle magically falls over due to gravity. Uh, but but in practice, that's not what happens. What happens, what, in practice, you have to have this, uh, this steering mechanism to just keep it along its way. So, now, if, uh, if we're trying to figure this all out, and you guys will see this on your homework, if, uh, when you initiate your gravity turn, you initiate it by putting the vehicle at some angle, at, at some, some angle with respect to vertical, and you do this gently enough so that, it, again, the vehicle and the velocity vector stay Line with each other, but you give it some initial value of theta, that is the angle to the vertical. And then after that time, the equations, they basically just integrate themselves given the, given the value of the thrust at a given moment and the, and the value of the, of the mass and all the other things in the equations. There's no other steering parameters at all. So you just have to integrate the burnout, and then if you didn't pick an appropriate initial angle, then you're gonna get to burnout and you're not going to be going horizontal, and you're, and, um, or if you are going horizontal, you're in general going to be going the wrong speed. So the, basically the initial conditions at the start of your gravity turn have to be such that, that way at the other end of your integration, 
you're going horizontally with your right speed to get up to your parking lot. And so this is going to be one of these things where you um, where you, you vary your initial conditions with unknown in order to get unknown. Um, well, your initial conditions are unknown, and you have to kind of shoot to find a given set of parking conditions. And actually, this is a little bit like what you did on the on the first one of the day, because we have an equation, you have equations which give you area ratio as a function of Mach number, but those equations cannot be inverted. And what you really want is Mach number as a function of area ratio. In other words, if you make your nozzle this big, what's going to be the Mach number? So in order to do that, you have to sort of do the trial and error thing. And the same thing is going to be true here. Um, we're going to pick an initial angle and uh, and pick that with the uh, with the idea that we're going to be burning out at a, uh, that we're going to be burning out we're going horizontal. And that's going to turn out to be a unique number. And now, the, the change of attitude, in other words, the rotation of the vehicle, the vehicle has to actually follow this curve, so the vehicle has to be steered. And so the way that works is, you have to be able to, to, uh, you have to do this thing called TVC, thrust vector control. And how do you do that? Um, the most common way is you actually gimbal an engine. So if you have a, if you have this big, here's the wall of your of your like first stage vehicle. So this is of course a, a kind of a simplified deal. But let's say you have a, a, a liquid, say you have a single liquid propelled engine. So it looks schematically a little like this. Of course, I'm ignoring huge amounts of, of height and so on, but if uh, the general idea is that you have, you're, you connect this thing to your vehicle with hydraulics, and I've shown just two, which is enough to actuate the plane, but of course there's going to be three or four. Um, three is minimal, but four gives you some redundancy. If, uh, if, the, if, if this were a 2D world, then two hydraulics would be enough to work this thing. Hydraulic being the thing that you can command it to extend or, or, uh, or, uh, or contract. And so, the, this thing would then, if you extend this guy, then it tends to turn the vehicle like that and provide a thrust vector that way and steer the whole vehicle that way. And of course, the other way goes the other way. So in reality, we need to have more of these in order to steer in 3D. So you have to be able to, uh, to deflect the engine in any, in any direction. Now, many big stage vehicles use a combination of engines. They may use a whole bunch of liquid engines. Russian vehicles may use Proton, I think, has 22 <coughs> engines, because their engines tend not to be that big, um, but they use a whole bunch of them. And I'm, uh, I've never checked this out, but I'm pretty confident they don't steer all of them, because why would they, you know? Um, but for, for US vehicles, they tend to use a much smaller number of engines. And uh, I believe, I haven't, I should really know this, but I haven't actually checked to see for a vehicle that has, say, three liquid engines, if they actually steer all of them or if they just steer one. I think they may just steer one because US engines or US launch vehicles cannot tolerate the loss of, of uh, one liquid engine because they use so few. They use bigger engines, but not so many, whereas Russians use a whole bunch. So they can actually tolerate the loss of a few engines. So a proton, you can lose like three engines, but they will still put you in orbit. OK, but anyway, if you, if, you use, if you use like a small number of liquid engines and solid strap-ons, like a, like a Titan III, for example, the, the solids aren't going to steer, but the, uh, but the liquids will. And by the way, one thing I didn't say anything about, uh, you have to be able to do roll control. And actually, it's hard to do roll control if all you have is one engine. Um, you could do roll control if, uh, if you have multiple engines. If you had them right next to each other, you could imagine steering like that, and that would tend to make your vehicle roll. Uh, so uh, now, in um, so that, that's gimbaling of engines. Another way you can do this, the, uh, the, the V2s, um, they actually had these, uh, they actually had these gimbals sitting in the exhaust. Um, I'm sorry, not gimbals, but vanes. Um, so these are basically like, uh, they're like ailerons, and you know they turn and just physically deflect the exhaust. So these are mounted at the back end of the nozzle, and as you might expect, they don't, they don't do that well. They don't survive all that well. The, uh, the V2s didn't actually fire all that long, and they did, and they didn't steer all that accurately, but they steered accurately enough to basically get to London, or close to London, 
and they cause a lot of damage. Um, there was a big worry that they would get to the next generation of the V2s and, and, uh, and get to intercontinental missiles. Um, there wasn't, as it turned out, that much danger of that during the war. But, uh, they, they would have the war and kept going if they had had access to material. So OK, this is, uh, this is not a class about controls. So let me just mention extremely briefly the uh, in engineering, Anytime you have something that you want to maintain uh, in a certain attitude or a certain something, certain something, there's always they're all the same in a certain abstract sense. There's always got to be a way you set the thing you want. There's got to be a way you sense what it actually is. There has to be a mechanism for subtracting those two. That's these days an op amp typically, and then you take the difference, and that difference is fed back into some kind of negative feedback thing to to try to make the the thing you that you have steer back toward the thing you wanted. And the first thing that I ever built like this, the first experimental thing that I built like this was a, uh, was a flow regulator uh, because I, had, uh, I wanted to build a thing that would deliver a certain number of, of cubic centimeters per second of hydrogen into an arc jet. And I didn't have the money at that time for the entire flow controller, which had the feedback loop built in. So I had enough money for the sensor, so I bought the sensor and I, I, built, the, I built the controller. And and when I first when I first brought it up, it had a, it had a MOSFET for controlling the voltage on the on the flow valve, and and it sent it. I had a knob for setting the, the flow that I wanted, and I had a measurement to determine what what it actually was. And there was a, a thing that subtracted them, and you know it was just this electric circuit. And I turned the thing on, and uh, it sort of worked. It, it kind of went. Call this instability. It, uh, it, uh, it oscillated, and so it turned out that the, uh, that the there was a kind of a slowness in the, in the response of the system, and a sort of a delay in the correction, and this kind of thing. You'll learn all this when you take control. Um, the, uh, the the system had gain at a certain low frequency and went unstable. And in fact, what I it turned out I had to do was was uh, was integrating my error signal and uh, using one more op amp and a couple of resistors, and that turned out to solve the problem. So, uh, and then I hadn't taken control theory at that time. In fact, I never did, but I read the book very well. And then I learned out, oh, I had, I now put, I now use a, uh, and I use an integral controller. So I didn't even know what that was, but I sort of invented it. So, not the first one. So, okay, so, uh, so we're not studying the control, but the but the, uh, the there is some kind of control system which determines the direction that you want your vehicle to go in, and this vane or this or the or this engine will turn in such a way as to steer the vehicle back toward where it wants to go. That's one example of, of a control system. And basically, every engineering system there is has a bunch of controls. Okay, so if um, are we doing? Are we still? Okay, so let's give an example of this. Suppose, suppose we have our, we do our program turn, and we have some initial speed. These are not necessarily that realistic number. The speed actually is kind of low. But let's suppose we're only moving 100 meters per second, and suppose we're five degrees from the vehicle. I mean, five degrees from the vertical. Now, if uh, we have an equation, you remember the. Uh, gravity times sine of theta is V times d theta dt. And so we can just solve for what d theta dt is. And it turns out to be half a degree per second. Now, if uh, at the other end of the gravity turn, we're going a lot faster, and, and we integrate that out to 90 degrees, then the, then the rocket is turning at like 0.1 degree per second. So it may be turning comparatively rapidly, half a degree per second, at the beginning of the turn, but it could turn slower and slower as you go toward, burn, toward burnout, as you go faster and faster. I mean, faster in linear direction, but slower in terms of rotation rate. Okay, um, now I have just a few kind of general things to say about, uh, about numerical methods. And this thing, actually, we did this already. Uh, I had a whole, kind of a whole lecture on that. And um, solution of partial differential equations I will sort of mention that we're not going to do that in here. Um, this would be just for example, if you wanted to, if you wanted to really do fluid mechanics, then then what you have is the Navier-Stokes equations, which give 
partial derivatives of, uh, of all the flow variables with respect to uh, with respect to time in terms of their partial derivatives with respect to distance, and in some cases their second partial derivatives with respect to, to space. And so when you solve those, you, you can find a time-dependent, space-dependent uh, velocity flow field. And that's a whole big, that's a whole huge area that I'm not going to touch on. This thing, root finding, this is an important thing. And actually, you had to do this on your homework today. Um, I said on the homework, I said find the, the uh, Mach number by trial and error. But in fact, as you would imagine, there's systematic methods for doing what we just do with trial and error. There are systematic methods for saying, okay, I don't know what the right answer for this thing is, but is this too small, it's too big, okay, I'm gonna move back and forth, that's okay, zero in on six, six in the figures, so my tolerance is very good, and here's my accuracy. So there's this whole thing called root finding, which basically does trial and error solutions. So um, well, this is a this is just an example of the kind of thing that you do if you're going to actually do the fluid mechanics. So this is, this is an actual grid for, uh, for studying the flow inside of and just downstream of uh, a rocket nozzle. So this is, this is sort of upstream. You get, you end up getting, this is the this is throat, so you get a mock disc here, supersonic flow here. Um, this is a, a fairly gently expanding model, <coughs> as you can tell. So um, the, it's hard to tell from the, from the print resolution, but basically we have these, these kind of tiny numerical cells. And what you do is you take the you take the partial differential equations, which are of course continuous, they have derivatives in them which are continuously defined, and you make the approximation that the function takes on discrete values at the corners of the cells, or in the center of the cells, depending on which variables. And then and you basically approximate the differential equations by assuming they take on either linearly varying values in the cells or constant values in the cells. And then you write down your equations like that. And then the smaller cells you have, the more accurate your equations are. So that's how you do partial differential equations. You pretty much never do them by finding analytic solutions, at least not for complicated things like fluid mechanics. Okay. And then, you know, this is, uh, this is the kind of results you can get. This is, uh, these are Mach numbers. So you notice that, that one, is a transition from like turquoise to medium blue or something. So sure enough, that happens like here. And by the way, it turns out if you do two and three D fluid mechanics, you don't have precisely Mach one occurring here. It's actually in a sort of a, a, a concave um, or convex disk looking looking down the, the axis. Um, and there's some interesting stuff happening inside the nozzle. Okay. Now I want to talk about root finding, and I have four minutes, so basically I'll just, uh, let me sort of get started on this. So, we have a couple of examples of these. This is the one you just did in your homework. Find a knowledge length and Mach number for a given area ratio. Because of course the formulas go the other way. The formulas give you an area ratio as a function of Mach number, but you have to turn that around. Now we have the same thing for time since periods. Because remember we have these formulas for how much time has passed since the spacecraft came through its periodicity. But that isn't what you often want to know. Most of the time, what you want to know is, where is it at a given time, which is turning those formulas around. These, again, you remember they have these complicated ratio, you know, rational functions with signs in them and stuff. So you cannot invert those. So this is the so-called Kepler's problem. And so we use iterative solutions for these. You can use iterative solutions for these two, or you can just use a, a simple refining technique. So, so basically, this is the thing we're looking for. And if you graph this, um, suppose we have two functions, and we're trying to find out where those two things cross. And in this case, I've shown a place where two of these things cross. And, and by the way, I, you, you aero guys may have run into a thing like this in aircraft performance. Because one of the things that, that you have to know for aircraft is, suppose one of these curves is the, uh, is the, the power available from your engine as a function of speed. And for a, jet, for a jet engine, this thing is uh, this thing is going to be like practically a line at some slope. For a propeller engine, it's going to be basically horizontal. And then, meanwhile, also as a function of speed, you have how much engine, how much power you need to keep the thing flying. And as you go off to high speed, then then you get a uh, you get uh, that goes off to infinity because of the use drag. At low speed, you get uh, you get because of parasitic drag. And so somewhere in between. The place where those two things cross 
those would be engines in your operating envelope. You can't fly too slow because your engine doesn't make enough power, and you can't fly too high, too fast, because again, your engine doesn't make power. So, so this is the area that your, that your engine can operate in. And, where, and there's gonna be two points, which are the extremes. Now, now you notice I said that, that uh, root finding is when a function is equal to zero. But this is like two separate functions. You're trying to find out where they're equal. Those are the same thing. So basically what we're trying to do is find the roots of f1 of x minus f2 of x. So the, form, the, the, the problem in this form is kind of, this is what usually happens. This is the problem you usually want to solve. So for example, in the, uh, in the homework, you have a, uh, in the homework you have the, a, um, a given Mach number uh, variation and you want to find out where that's equal to a given area ratio variation. Um, now the way the mathematicians do this, uh, they reduce it to a simpler problem where you find where the, uh, where this, where the difference between two functions is equal to zero. And mathematicians all want to simplify stuff. And so if you know how to do this, then you can do that. And I have like 10 minutes some more to show. Okay, so, so this is the problem we want to solve. We have some function, which could be the difference between those two other functions. But anyway, it's some function that we want to find out where it crosses zero. And again, I've shown it may go through zero a couple of places. And a lot of time, like for the thing you just had, there turn out to be two Mach numbers that satisfy your thing. One is subsonic, one is supersonic. It's a supersonic one you want, of course, because you want the thing that's not So uh, next time I'll show how we actually do this. And uh, other than that, we're, we're, uh, we're done with this for By the way, let me just say one thing about your exams. I sent you an email just before class. I had them graded yesterday, actually, but I didn't, I didn't enter the grade until, uh, until the day, just before class. And uh, I didn't grade them because I had a bunch of work to get back, and I feel like school put everything together, put everything together. So just come by my office and try to borrow perfectly and have to have everything I have to do.